welcome to my talk, more on names and naming in Gorwa. I've spoken about names and naming in Gorwa before, but much of the previous data consisted of Gorwa people explaining how things worked in a rather general manner. New data, including interviews with Gorwa parents about how their own children got their names, adds further detail to the existing account, as well as perspective based on what Gorwa people actually do rather than what they say they do. Focusing on three questions, how are Gorwa names given, who are Gorwa names given by, and to what extent and in what ways are Gorwa names and naming an endangered verbal art, this talk provides additional detail, expands our understanding, and brings us closer to an informed account of this interesting and important aspect of the Gorwa language. As a note, this talk will be made openly accessible online shortly after its live presentation, both archived with Zenodo with the DOI on screen, as well as watchable directly on YouTube via the channel link QR code on screen. I'll make use of a handful of QR codes throughout this talk, so if you're interested, please feel free to scan and follow. For a bit further context, my work with Gorwa began in 2012 during my master's studies at the University of Dar es Salaam, where I began making recordings of the Gorwa language as part of my dissertation. This continued on and off through my doctoral studies at SOAS, during which I continued working with Gorwa within an essentially lone wolf language documentation model, making recordings on my own and deciding the who, what, when, where, and why of the language documentation myself. Things changed around 2017 when myself and my Gorwa colleagues decided to try something new. Instead of me going around with the camera and the recording device, we decided that actually training Gorwa speakers themselves to conduct this work would not only be more efficient, but would also result in a richer documentation. So from this point, essentially to present, the Gorwa language documentation project continues with Gorwa speakers themselves not only producing the recordings, but deciding who to interview, what to talk about, and how to go about exploring their own histories, languages, and cultures. In later years, I've also been involved in documentary projects with both the Ihanzu speaker community together and together with my colleague Richard Griscom, the Hadza speaker community. Both of these projects also employ an insider-led model and can be seen as components of a larger effort to learn more about the languages, histories, and cultures of the people of the Tanzanian Rift Valley, the area in which all three of these languages are spoken. Obviously, our focus today will be on Gorwa. Uh, Gorwa is spoken in Tanzania, primarily within the highlighted area in the map inset, which is itself within a larger area of north-central Tanzania that myself and others often refer to as the Tanzanian Rift Valley. Obviously, because of time constraints here, the information I can provide today is limited, so for more information on the language, I'd encourage you to consult a 2019 paper I wrote, which can be accessed via the QR code that I'll leave on screen for the next few slides. Genetically speaking, Gorwa is a Cushitic language, specifically of the southern Cushitic branch of Cushitic, which itself is a member of the larger Afroasiatic language phylum. From this map, from a classical work on the Tanzanian Rift Valley, we can see that Gorwa exists in a rich regional language ecology. This includes other southern Cushitic languages, Iraq, Alagwa, and Burungay. Nilotic languages, including Eastern Nilotic Maasai and probably more significantly the Southern Nilotic Datoga varieties. Bantu languages, both from the Takama branch of Bantu, including languages like Ihanzu, Nyilamba, and Nyaturu, as well as Bantu of other affiliation, including Gogo, Kilimanjaro Bantu languages, and uh, then less certainly uh, Rangi and Mbugwe. Uh, Sandawe as well, which is possibly a distant member of the Khoikhwadi group of languages, as well as the language isolate Hadza. In terms of language use and attitudes, I would first say that this topic deserves considerably more attention, but suffice it to say that Gorwa has around 133,000 speakers, and its usage is certainly declining as its speakers switch to using the national lingua franca Swahili. In my experience, language attitudes are characterized by a divide in both age and whether speakers live in urban or rural areas. Um, so with the language seen as more relevant and valuable among the old and those living in rural areas. In order to get a feel for how the language sounds and looks, I would like now to continue playing the clip we saw earlier of Raheli Lawi talking about her children and how they got their names. 
Mungu na male haris kurkumbe lahone gwalel na algarma na isi o masin na imwa sa kweni na tlutwa he na iwa seri e ah kusi mo sa tlutwa asma kwena wara ah mwa lokal tare mi bani dakat sahmi bani wak kurkumbe lahone gwalel ba se na wane si an kwai alo ya aku ku dor ne der hiya tsanguli gar ma hiya ne ne aku tsanguli a hae insku bal waya waya biye biye ne tsanguli a hae as the title of this talk suggests, this is not the first time I've spoken on names and naming in Gorwa. In 2019, I gave a presentation on this topic at a different venue in which I presented a typology of naming conventions, noting that naming is the primary responsibility of the mother and mother-in-law, asserting that names and naming in Gorwa is a way of recording history, and arguing that names and naming should be considered an endangered verbal art. In 2021, myself and my colleague Crispina Alphonse gave a talk which attempted to place Gorwa as well as its larger sister language, Iraq, in a larger Tanzanian context. One of the statements given here was that naming is the primary responsibility of men on the child's father's side of the family, which in fact runs contrary to my 2019 observation. For this talk, we will take these 2021 observations, as well as those from 2019, and attempt to address some of them anew. As such, the key questions of this talk will be how are Gorwa names given, who are Gorwa names given by, and to what extent and in what ways are Gorwa names and naming an endangered verbal art. What makes this talk a novel contribution is that it takes into account two significant new sources of data. 12 interviews with Gorwa parents, in which they explain how their own children came to acquire their names, as well as a register of names of school children at one village school in the Gorwa-speaking area, dating back to the early 1980s and extending to present. All interviews were recorded with the consent of the interviewees, and as such, will, made, will be made openly accessible as part of the Gorwa collection in the ELAR archive, which can be accessed by the QR code on screen. The school register was copied with the consent of the current school administration, but because it contains personal information about a large number of people, I've decided that access to this particular data source will remain restricted. Let's start now with the first key question. How are Gorwa names given? In previous presentations on this topic, I've provided a four-way typology of Gorwa naming conventions, all of which are basically confirmed in the new interviews. So, circumstantial naming refers to naming a child based on the circumstances surrounding their birth. In an interview with Hi'iti Dathlo, this is how her in-laws chose the name of her son. Uai, its meaning is rain, and on that day I gave birth to a child. That's why he was given this name. Familial naming refers to naming a child by giving him or her the name of a relative. This is probably a familiar concept to those of us in the audience today, but I would like to draw attention to just how prodigious many Gorwa people's familial knowledge is. Here, as he explains why he named one of his sons Dito, Akasi Gurti, without hesitation, names each of his ancestors right up to the Dito after whom his son was named, fully nine generations back. So, we have... Akasi Gurti, Gurti Karesi, Karesi Shamwed, Shamwed Adwed, Adwed of the House of Shorompi, Shorompi Sarahi, Sarahi Difta, Difta Duank Ed, Duank Ed Dito, and Dito, his mother, was the one who hid in the stable because she was pregnant because of the Maasai War. So Dito meaning a stable for small livestock. Akasi goes on to further explain that the name Dito is a mnemonic, as he puts it, a memory of a historical past. That's the meaning of Dito. We saw it was our memory. Tributary naming plays a similar mnemonic function, where children are named for figures of power, including traditional doctors or political leaders. In this case, Rashidi Uo's son is not named Uo in a familial sense, but as a connection to Uo Mayo, 
one of the hereditary Gorwa chiefs. His home name is Uo, the name of the leaders, says Rashidi. Talismanic naming refers to the naming of a child by one of a small subset of names which offers them a sort of protection. In this case, Nunuka Siku says that she named her daughter Soki, derived from the verb Sokmi, to tire, because after three daughters, she wanted a son. By naming her daughter in this way, it was a manner of communicating to greater powers that they were ready for a boy. Soki, we were tired of having girls. One additional case came up in the interviews that I hadn't seen before, that of a child getting a name based on a word or name unique to a single family. In this case, Rashidi Uo explains that his son was called Doli. This name, we didn't call him ourselves, the children got it for him. Little children called him Doli in those days, and now that's his name. I'll temporarily call this new naming conven convention Ex Domo from the household. As a further note, the interviews answered a question I had had for a long time. Because most Gorba names are unisex, that is, most names can be used equally for a boy or girl, I wondered if this meant that a child might be named after a relative of a different sex. This did actually turn up in two interviews, uh, one boy being named Kwanzawe after a paternal, paternal aunt, and another boy being named Sakware after a female relative. It also turns out that Gorwa people will take more than one naming convention into account when naming a child. In this case, the birth of Takasi Gurti's first child took place during a famine. This would have raised an entire field of possible names which could have been used to describe the circumstance. But of these, a name was chosen which also corresponded to the name of an ancestor. So, the first child is Kadwed. There was a famine. The old men and the women gathered together and went to the traditional doctor. That's the meaning of this name. And so, also, it's the name of an elder. The second key question is, who are Gorwa names given by? It will be remembered that this is a point on which the 2019 and 2021 talks disagree. Turning to the interviews once again, it becomes very clear that in practice, it is always the senior members of the father's side of the family, so the Patrick clan, who will name the child. Rashidi Uo formulates the hierarchy as if the grandfather is alive, he names the child. If the grandfather is gone, then it is the grandmother. And if the grandmother is gone, it is the paternal aunt. This is justified by Hilu Teesa, who establishes that these are the individuals best suited for the job because it is these people whose knowledge of the relevant kin is most extensive. Mother and father-in-law know the names. It's them who say the names. The final question I would like to touch on today is to what extent and in what ways are Gorwat names and naming an endangered verbal art? So in 2019, using the names of the participants in the Gorwa documentation, charted along with their birth dates, I could plot a rough chart showing average use of Gorwa names from 1910 to 2000. This measurement showed a decrease of 50% in average use of Gorwa names over that period. One of the problems, however, is that with only around 250 participants, give or take, the measure was only a rough one at best. So this would be where information from the school register makes an interesting parallel data source, including information such as the student's name and date of birth, as well as whether or not they are Gorwa. Hypothetically, a similar chart could be made, this time with many more names stretching from the late 1960s to the turn of the millennium. I am, however, still in the process of tallying up the figures from this new and very rich data set, so I don't have a companion chart to the one shown in the last slide yet. With that said, I do have some quick preliminary observations. Starting in the mid-1970s, I encountered a common clerical practice of striking out Gorwa names, especially those which are hard to pronounce for non-Gorwa-speaking people, and replacing them with non-Gorwa names. These replacement names are often Western names or modeled on Western names. In this case, we see a girl renamed Stella from her originally written name, Khimbili. In the case immediately below, we see Amsi, becoming Joyce. This practice of children's Gorwa names being suppressed in favor of a school name was mentioned in one of the interviews where a father says that two of his sons, Turi and Tekwai, were given the names Juma and Ali in school, respectively. To conclude, this talk provided an update of ongoing work on the verbal art of names and naming in Gorwa. 
availing of new data including lists of names and birth dates, as well as interviews with parents on how their own children came to acquire their names. This talk has seen new details about how Gorwa names are given, who they are given by, as well as one example of how the art of naming has been oppressed by actors in the formal education system. Perhaps more than anything, however, this talk has served as a reminder that research methods which are observational, paying attention to how people name their children rather than how they say they name their children, can offer a rich window into practices which are often obscured. Thank you, and here are my references.